So I'm not sure if you guys have heard of Coverity, but uh, we're, we're a company that does something very interesting with regards to software. Um, if you guys have heard of Find Bugs, right? Uh, what we do is we do that like at another level, right? Basically, you know, for us, testing is part of our culture because of what we do. We find bugs for other people, right? So what we're trying to do is actually apply this and dog food our, our motto to all of our internal apps. So in some places, it's worked very well internally. In other places, right, like this web app, because of historical reasons, they've had real difficulty, you know, instrumenting and testing these things, right? So what we need to be able to do is essentially without having to do a full rewrite, in the middle of an evolving development cycle, instrument and put in test, right? So unlike, you know, the luxury that you had, Marcus, which I totally envy, right, is the fact that you started at the beginning and said, we need these things before we can even test. I don't have that luxury, right? So, you know, this is what we do. And essentially, we basically take source code, right? C, C++, Java, C Sharp, enterprise stuff, right? So we have, you know, all the software development companies in Japan pretty much use us. We have big companies that use us for their internal projects. And what we do is, essentially, we find defects in the code before you even run it, right? So we do a full parsing of the source code tree. We provide, you know, we create an abstract syntax tree, and then we apply a bunch of heuristics to basically tell you these are the places where your, your code can be f compromised, right? Or broken, right? So, you know, we have a culture of testing. You know, we support something like probably 20 odd different platforms, Unix, right? And probably over a dozen compilers, and we test on all those platforms, right? So we already have a lot of automation in place, right? The challenge, of course, is taking one of our core products, right? that we're starting to put emphasis on and actually automate for that. So, you know, as you all know, you've probably run into, you know, projects where you can't start from scratch, right? So you have to change your strategy slightly, either reduce your expectations about what can be automated, right? Or, you know, find some other clever way of doing it, right? So, you know, this is what I, I'm gonna talk about, right? So. Sorry, <laughs> that's okay. Um, it seems to me that this is a problem that a lot of people have already, right? So it's just a question of, you know, how can we approach this in a way that's fairly structured? And part of it comes down to, you know, a lot of automation tools were geared towards QA, right? QA people who like to use an IDE that weren't programmers that essentially went in and looked physically at the application and clicked on particular elements. That's good to a point, right? Until you have to put any type of conditional logic that it has to be data-driven, any of that stuff. And then, of course, it falls apart very quickly, right? Not only that, the choice of the framework makes a difference. So I, I, I previously coded you know, a framework using Selenium 1, right? And then when the Selenium 2 came out, right, with WebDriver, imagine what happens to the API, right? It's a completely different API. So do you rewrite your tests? Do you keep those tests around because they have backwards compatibility? Obviously, there has to be a better way to manage you know, the evolution of change, right? Because it's happening at the fundamental layer where we're testing, the tool we're testing with, all the way to the application under test, right? So these are things that we have to actually talk about. So I built this framework. It's open sourced, so you can have a look at it. I think, as I was saying to these people earlier, you know, it might not be as useful unless you're using Java as your primary tool, but it, it, from a design standpoint, maybe the patterns might be a little bit more interesting so that you could take the, these ideas, put them into .NET, put them into you know, Ruby, Python, whatever language it is that you're actually looking for. Because what, what I've found is that after having done this a few times is that there are certain qualities that we're looking for in the framework that are not tied necessarily to the implementation. And, you know, I've heard people talk about it, right? So this is what I wanted to bring up today, right? So qualities of the system under test, right? Essentially what you have is if you haven't instrumented your app for test, there's a good chance that you won't be able to test stuff. So there's two points, two things that I had to deal with intimately just as a, you know, anecdote here. Java applets. Has anyone ever tried to like automate a Java applet in a browser? Well, people do that, right? And essentially, 
To be able to do that, either you have to create a custom adapter, which I did, right, to automate that, or move your logic out of that Java applet into HTML. How about Flash, right? So same thing, right? Those are things that are very difficult to automate, right? If you're, if you're in that position, then, you know, you have a world of hurt, especially if you rely on it for a lot of stuff, right? So <clears throat> the other thing is, you know, like I said, at some point, the, the solution is programmatic, right? You have to step away from the IDE and basically say, we're going to apply logic, we're going to apply the same programming principles, which I'll illustrate, right? Allow you to have a framework that accommodates change, right? So the first thing I, I always say is, you know, WebDriver is an automation API. It doesn't give you any structure with regard, it doesn't know anything about your application, the types of things you want to test. So what you really need to do is essentially say, okay, we can automate, but how do we automate? What do we automate, right? Just because you can call it directly and make it do these cool things, there's a certain critical mass where your tests basically implode on themselves because the dependencies are too strong because you're calling WebDriver and you have not enough structure around your tests itself, right? So you have to provide the structure, right? Part of it, they've given us a solution for the page object. Now, whether or not you use a page factory or not, that's entirely up to you. But using page object is really important, right? Because it gives you a reusable context when you're actually trying to create this framework, right? So we have to start in the middle, right? One of the other things is, you know, you have to test the application that you actually have as opposed to the one that you'd like to have, right? So there's a lot of compromises to be made. So in the application that I'm testing now, right, I'd say we have probably 40% coverage with IDs, right? So that other 60%, we could either basically say we can't test that, right, or find other ways to do it. And you have a whole slew of methods. You can do it by CSS selector. You can, you know, do it by name, right? What, what it comes down to essentially, though, is coordinating with the development team because you have to choose a strategy, right? And then move towards that strategy. It's always, you know, a strategy of being able to evolve to the point where you'd like to be as opposed to just being there now. So, so I think the biggest quality, right, in these frameworks is adaptability. Right? If you don't have these, right, you're basically dead in the water even before you've started. So appropriate abstractions. I'll talk about the two that I think are the most important, the page and the element. But also, this minimizing duplicate code. You know, I don't like to see tests that do the same thing and they have the same you know, three lines of code, even if it's two, right, all over the place. You know, as soon as you see that, you have to start thinking like a programmer and saying, where can I put that where it makes sense? right, to minimize the impact of that change. So that if I ever reuse that, or that particular bit changes, you can change it in one place, right? It needs to have a canonical definition of where, where that might be. The other thing is literate code, because you know what? Whenever you start coding, right, there's a good chance if any amount of time passes and you go back to that code and it's not literate, you will have to basically spend time trying to figure out what it does, right? So you have to make sure that your code is as readable as what it, it should communicate its, its intent as clearly as possible, right? And then the last one is decoupling implementation from use, right? This is basically the, what Marcus mentioned earlier, everything codes to an interface. If you, do, if you depend directly on the implementation, right, you, you're gonna have issues, right? So one of the talks earlier talked about using domain objects, right? And if you start creating these rich domain objects that have basically hooks to every part of your application, you've basically undone yourself, right? Because one change in an application undoes a core fundamental object of your framework, right? So that's why I would highly recommend dependency injection. If you haven't looked it up, look it up because it's really important for you to decouple these things. And it buys you a number of things. First of all, you, you're decoupled so you can make changes to the implementation, but also it's testable. So if you don't treat your tests, your, your tests as code, right? That's another problem, right? So you'll notice that the framework that I supply has unit tests, right? And if you, don't, if you see a, a framework that doesn't have unit tests, run away, right? Because as soon as you make a simple, trivial change, it will break in 
very unexpected ways, right? So, <laughs> so the page, right? Um, it's really important to understand that we're not talking about a, a, I use page loosely here. So maybe the better word for this is context. So let me show you what I mean by page, right? Um, if you actually look at this particular application, this is the one that I'm currently testing, you'll notice that this navigational element here where I'm moving my mouse over, right, is common to a lot of different contexts, right? So do you code one of those for each page that actually has it? Like this one, right? Under filters, right? Or this one, right? You don't. Essentially what you want to do is have these parts as reusable testable components as well. So that when you make a test against this, you're almost guaranteed that it should pass in all the other places that it's reused, right? So you have to start thinking about the application, you know, in terms of, you know, how things are laid out in its entirety as opposed to very, you know, myopically in one particular context, right? So essentially the, the pages are factories that supply the elements, right? So if you're within that particular context, you can find certain elements. That, that kind of goes hand in hand. What's not intuitive is navigation. So you have these contexts, these pages. How do you get from one page to another, right? And this, is, this varies pretty much dramatically between applications. So you have essentially a hierarchical navigation where you have perhaps navigation across the top, and that'll take you to every place you need to go in an application. You're lucky if you have that, because those are very easy to automate. In our particular case, you can go a number of different ways. You can use those tabs. You can click on a cell in a grid. The cell in a grid might take you to a different place, depending on what you clicked. So you know those navigational traversals have to be modeled within the actual framework. And the challenge there is then, you know, how do you do that? I put it at the element level because, you know, I think the elements are actually responsible for doing that. And you can also create a composite then to say, you know, if you have that really beautiful, clean navigation that's a drop down that takes you everywhere that you want to go, you could still have use the same principle here, right, and basically end up with that, right? So, so the other thing is elements or strategies. Um, essentially, what I mean by this is that if you treat each element like they do in the page object, right, as finding a single element, that can't scale, right? Think of a grid that has the ability to display hundreds of, you know, individual cells. Or, you know, if you have a list and you're trying to pick something from a list, right? Um, what you have to think of then is a strategy for finding a type or class of element, right? So when you look at, we'll go back to the application, right? Um, see these drop, these uh, collapsible panels here? It would be madness to create one in our, in our page object for each one of these, when essentially they're only differentiated by some, one very simple thing, the, the label, right? So what you want to do is create elements that are essentially findable by a pattern, right? And that's where the regex, you know, analogy to with uh, XPath comes into play. Because, because it's a string, it gives us a lot of flexibility, including things like being able to create XPaths that essentially say, you know, I want you to find an element of this type, but instead of category, let's say, right, as the header, I want you to find the one that says new, right? <laughs> now you've just reduced by a factor of maybe 10, 15, the amount of work that you've had to do, right? So if you apply these strategies, essentially what you end up with is, is reusable pages, reusable elements, right? And when you have that, it also means that when you make changes to those things, you make them in a canonical fashion, meaning you make a change there, if that behavior changed everywhere, right, as is likely to happen if the UI designers are playing around with it, you can accommodate those changes trivially, right? So this application that I tested has actually gone through quite a substantial change in the last two months. And I've probably spent three days wiring the changes up, but not changing my tests, right? That's pretty significant. So imagine that time spent over the course of the life of an application, right? You write the test once, they basically, you know, preserve, 
preserve their intent while the application is evolving from underneath, right? So you have these tests that are fairly long-lived, right? That's the goal, right? You don't have these tests that you always have to rewrite, right? Regardless of these changes. So there's a one other side effect. You'll notice that I use the word interchangeable, right? So if, if you structure these things well, the other really brilliant thing is that, you know, UIs are likely to change. Also, the behaviors or types of elements can change as well. You could just change the type. So long as it resolves functionally to the same thing, you could pretty much use it the same way in your tests, right? So if that, you know, link becomes a, t a tab, right, or a button, it shouldn't matter, right? You should be able to keep the tests exactly the same way, right? So long as you can resolve that element, who cares, right? Cool. There. So I talked briefly about the navigational characteristics, right? Um, I think that one of the things that you'll notice that is that a lot of tests spend a lot of time getting to where they need to be before they can actually start the test. You need to take that out of the equation, right? Essentially, you should be able to have on each page, in each context, a method that says, take me here, right? And not worry about that, because obviously that's not what you're testing. You should have a whole set of tests completely different from that, right? If, that's what, if you're testing navigation, right? So those are the things that you should probably think about so that you can essentially lessen the burden on testers so that they can focus on the things that they need to test as opposed to getting to where they need to test, right? So what is a bias, right? So one of the things we can do is if we've isolated away, you know, WebDriver and its foibles, we can actually instrument pretty nicely, right? Um, one of the things that we've had to do is, and I've tried to focus on, is in this particular application, you know, being able to do dynamic weights. I think that having to do actual weighting, right, is completely destructive to your, to the stability and reproducibility of your tests, right? So you have to be able to accommodate for when the application is busy. And the only way to do this, right, without having to resort to a lot of, you know, internal UI wrangling is to instrument your app, right? You have to do this in conjunction with the developers. You can't do this in isolation. So if you have a really clear division between QA and dev and they don't communicate well, this isn't going to work. It will never work, right? That's the problem. So you have to break down those barriers, right? Because to be able to get this, it means that you need the cooperation of the developers as they're building stuff to, to not break the contract with tests that you know, you're relying on this behavior to be able to continue where it's required and wait when it's busy, right? It's fairly straightforward, right? Um, so one of the things that I really harp on is reusability. That also means to the UI elements. So the biggest thing that you can get out of this is probably, you know, using XPath reasonably well. So essentially the composite element pattern is you find parent elements or you, well, let's start at the bottom. You have primitive elements. You can have like radio buttons, you have text boxes, things that you can find in the DOM. But generally, you know, there are other things around them that give them context. So you might have a label, right, some text that says this is what this text box is, right? And you can build up richer behaviors. This is the way the UI designers approach it. They create a widget, right? That widget they reuse in a bunch of places. Why can't we use that same concept when we're actually modeling the elements that we're testing, right? So that's essentially what you do, right? You create these arbitrarily complex hierarchies, right, of elements. So that if, you know, let's say, I'll show you an example. So in one of our, uh, one of our controls, right, uh, projects, You'll notice that we have this little doohickey, right? Which is, you know, not only do we have a collapsible header, we have some text, we also have this rich calendar control, which may change in the future, right? Right? Its function, though, is to select a date. So your test should be able to select a date without knowing that it's using this control, right? 
So, you know, being able to automate something like this down to each one of these little, you know, drop downs and the little buttons, right? You can create composites to this level, right? So that this control here, which is, happens to be represented on this page, can be reused in a completely different context, right? Um, let's go here. Let me just see if I can find it. No. Sorry, there was another page that had it. Uh, let's, I thought it was here. Let me just check. Anyways, but yeah, if there's a date field around here, you'll notice that it's the same control. So now you've reduced the amount of time it takes for you to basically instrument your app. So just to give you an indication, I started basically wiring this app in probably late October, and I had it pretty much fully wired in about four weeks, right? That means you have a whole year to write tests, right? That's what you want. You don't want to be spending time building all this stuff yourself, right? If you, what you want to be is in the position to be writing tests that provide value, not wiring for change and all this other stuff. You want to have that as quickly as possible, right? So. <laughs> So one of the biggest advantages is if you look at the framework, I use a particular pattern of builders and essentially objects that are created uh, on demand. So the beauty of that is essentially all those objects are immutable, right? And you can use them in a thread safe environment, right? So when I parallelize my tests, I don't have to worry about the dependencies between what I've already pulled in or used in my, my framework, right? Essentially you can use them whether they're running serially or in parallel, right? And you have to be careful about how you do this, right? Because it's really easy to introduce dependencies. So one of the things we also did was switch over to TestNG, right? Which allows you to run a bunch of stuff in parallel, which in, in a more straightforward fashion than JUnit, right? And uh, one of the advantages is, you know, you can basically know that you can go and hit any element in that test in that thread without interfering with any other test, right? So if they happen to be running different things, right, you never have to worry about it, right? And we implemented a class per test um, paradigm, right? The, the beauty of that too is that, you know, essentially if you're trying to run multiple methods in a, in a class, you generally keep state, right, bad for threading, right? So if you do a class per test, you're basically at this point ready to go, right? It's trivial for you to run these tests now in the cloud or against your grid, right? All in parallel, right? So the last thing, and you know, I, I think this is a little bit uh, important because like, uh, like the previous presentation, you know, I think one of the biggest problems is if the test fails and you can't say why, right? That test has no value. And not only that, developers are likely to ignore it, right? So if you don't want the developers to ignore it, you have to give them context. So if you structure the tests in a certain way, what you end up having is essentially namespace that describes you know, the hierarchical flow of your application, the element type that they are attempting to uh, manipulate, as well as you know, how to find it when they actually go into their browser. You give them the X path of the ID, right? So all these things with you know, logs, or if you're lucky enough to use Sauce Labs, Right, having the videos and screenshots, right, and the ability to replay those gives them enough context to be able to basically look at a bug, say, yes, we can do something about this and fix it, right? So, yeah, essentially you get flexibility, right? So, Einstein said something really interesting, you know, I think that's very applicable to test automation right now. Everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. We have to acknowledge the fact that, you know, what we're doing is fairly complex. We're actually getting a machine to do what humans did, right? And we're getting them to do it repetitively, maybe hundreds or thousands of times faster, right? We have to, you know, 
instead of trying to shy away from that complexity, we should probably embrace it and say, you know, this is a complex task. But if it is a complex task that is amenable to programmability, we should apply all the relevant programming concepts at our disposal as opposed to shying away from it, right? And I think that, you know, that buys you this type of flexibility, right? So if you guys want to check it out, it's on GitHub, right? Have a look, right? And uh, any questions? <laughs> Seeing as there's a few. <laughs> I'm curious to see if you, in the app, you declare, so you have a page object and that implements uh, elements, there are declarations and stuff like that? Or yeah, I'll, I'll show you what that looks like. Yeah. Let's do that. Um, I'm curious to see if you associate The tab with the element, yes. Right. Um, so let me show you what a, a test looks like. This test, and unfortunately it won't run right now because I haven't had a chance to update it since they fiddled with our reference data, not necessarily the, the framework. Essentially goes in, logs into uh, our application, and then essentially exercises all the, uh, the filters, those composite uh, controls on the side, right, actually automates the um, calendar, right, and then selects something from the grid, right, actually plays with the grid headers before actually clicking within the actual grid columns. And notice that if you read this, it's pretty clear what it's doing, right? I'm not referencing, you know, index zero, like row zero, column one, or whatever. If you look at the app, you should be able to look at this and say, exercise linkable cells. The grid column is project, and you know, the row is CES or sample CES. So, uh, do they change that column order ever? Do you have to hand maintain that? Uh, so the reason why we had to do this is, I'll show you the feature. Right. <laughs> right? You can actually do it. Now, it's broken right now, right? But you can rearrange all the rows. You can also, in this particular case, all these columns that you see on the side, or all the columns that are visible are configurable. All of the filters on the side are configurable. If you had to accommodate all variations at all times with all types of data, including data that could possibly be generated by a customer, you wouldn't be able to do it, right? What we did for that particular example was we understood which columns were associated with which grid, and we had the developer's instrument, a hidden div, every time the page was rendered that told us, this column is at this index, this column is at right. this index. Right. So you want to know how I did it? Yeah. All right. <laughs> I did it at the cell level, and I can show you the code. So... I did it much easier so that to be consistent without having to introduce anything else more onerous to the, uh, the, dev, the devs, I actually use XPath fairly extensively. So let me make this full screen because my XPaths are both long and the code is not easy enough. So we've complicated things. You think that within a cell, right, you'd have a single type. That's not what our devs did. We have ones that are linkable. We have ones that are read-only, right? So we have to make account for those variations. Not only that, if you want to look, yeah, you could have check boxes. They could be drop downs, and I'm sure they're going to do that at some point, right? So you have to be able to accommodate for that in your composite. So I use this. See this really big, long, nasty X path? Believe it or not, this will allow you to find the index on the column, right? dynamically, so if they move it around, and using a row identifier, something that makes the, you know, that particular row unique, you can find the cell. Right. Yeah. Does it work when you change to another language? Yes, right, because you'd still be looking for that, that cell using that language. So what, localization is an important key for us, right, because we actually have our app localized to Japanese right now. So when we have these mechanisms, what we want to be able to do is reuse them across languages. Internationalization then becomes a non-issue. We don't have to write two sets of tests. We just have to change the data we feed into it, right? You said, I'm sorry, I, I got off track from the tab. No, no, that's okay. No, it's okay. Um, so you want to see the tab thing, right? Yeah, I'm curious. Um, 
so what we do is <clears throat> essentially I'll walk you through. So this is our login page, right? And like I said to you, navigational context is kind of important, right? And you'll see that whenever you log into our application, it takes you to a projects page. Within this project page, right, you'll, you'll see, you know, the grid and the header that can be manipulated and all that other stuff. Um, you can also see the details. The details essentially is a synthetic kind of concept that holds the tabs because, you know, each one of those is a context that you want to be able to switch to, right? So if you go to the project details class, right, we have tabs, right, that we create, right? Yeah. You can find them this way. If you go to the actual implementation of that context, we have the collapsible checkboxes like this, right, that you can see, right? We've tried to simplify some of this. We'll probably create helpers to, you know, make this a little bit easier to build. But essentially, yeah, that's how it works, right? Each one of these, the most important function, if you look at this, right, is we have a constructor for this defect page. And you'll notice that I use this I page and we pass in the parent. This is another important thing, right? This framework essentially runs a web driver per test and passes it on to all the pages that it, it, it touches. So that's another thing, right? WebDriver in and of itself is not thread safe, but if you use it through thread confinement, so we have a single instance on a thread that doesn't share state with any other threads, you get to go, right? So that's how, how that all works, right? So yeah, there you go. That's where it takes you to, the defects tab, right? Or should you want to go to the source? Um, looks like this. So you're probably wondering, what are these things at the top? So we tried doing this with strings, but you know what? Really, when you're writing tests, strings are too brittle. So what we did was created statics to basically say, this is the filter tab at this place. That's what the source get class name is, right? So we can say, it was this tab that failed, or this control that failed, right? Because we have essentially all the context provided by the class, right? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it would be nice to, so going back to what your presentation, because I think it's really important here, all this stuff, yeah. Yeah. It's okay. You know, I was going to just say the most important part of this is that all this stuff can probably be, probably be programmatically generated, right? Now, you know, when I first approached this project, the challenge was, you know, it was changing, and the JSP stuff that they had, it was okay, right? It would have been nice if, um, like in a previous project, they used a page registry that essentially had an abstract concept of, you know, it, does, it wasn't tied to a file, you just registered your page through it. So then it was automatically aware of the relationship between pages, right, and the types of elements that those pages would contain. Then you could use reflection to essentially query the, the application and say, this is what I want to model, to test, right? And then use something called the, jap, or the gap generation pattern, which is essentially that part that's created programmatically by reflection and the parts that you wire yourself, right? But it lessens the burden immensely. So I did it in .NET and I used the partial classes feature, right? And I used string template. So I could do that through the page reg registry. Essentially say, you know, tell me all the pages you know about, right? And as you find them, put them in the hierarchy and then I'm gonna wire an object graph, right, of class hierarchy of pages that you could traverse to be able to find your place in the application. And when you're there, tell me what elements you have, <laughs> right? <laughs> because that's what the application designers do, right? Why do the work twice, <laughs> right? So, yeah, that's the way to go, right? Yeah. So any other questions? <laughs> we have a lot of time, I think. <laughs> would just sort of, you'd, you'd be able to refer to it by action, and you didn't care about what VMs were underneath it. And every right. time they called a pound parse to bring in another VM, it just followed that recursively. Exactly. It would generate this. you just get this in yeah. your base page, 
and then have another derived page for exceptions that didn't work in Exactly. I'm curious, so you said uh, change from a button to a link and it just works. You had button. Oh, yeah. Uh, all you have to do is. Interfaces or? Yes. So if you look at these, so because we're creating composites, you want to create the composite in a, a fully realized state. You don't want to be doing it in the constructor. So I use the builder pattern. So if you're not familiar with that, essentially what it is is a static builder that's responsible for taking all the dependencies. So in this case, the dependent elements, right? Creating those before returning you a valid type of this object, this composite, right? So, yeah, so this builder, is, which is responsible just for creating tabs, is fairly straightforward. But if you look at something like the calendar one, it's actually built on top of composites. So there's, you can you have composites of composites of, and then elements, right? <laughs> you get the idea, right? It, you can do this recursively so you can have these really rich type of uh, modeling so that you can say, you know what, they changed that, just the collapsible panel part to some other thing, right? You could change that out and not affect any of the calendar <laughs> parts, right? Yeah. yeah, that's how you want to be, like just represent everything once, right? <laughs> yeah, so yeah. <laughs> any other questions? No? So yeah, that's it. <laughs>